Hi again. Walter Rauschenbusch, page 230 of Christianity and the Social Crisis. In the chapter, The Present Crisis, and this segment is entitled, The Work, Work and Wages. In the agricultural stage of society, the chief means of enrichment was to gain control over large landed wealth. The chief danger to the people lay in losing control of the great agricultural means of production, the land. Since the Industrial Revolution, the man-made machinery of production has assumed an importance formerly unknown. The factories, the machines, the means of transportation, the money to finance great undertakings are fully as important in the modern process of production as the land from which the raw material is drawn. Consequently, the chief way to enrichment in an industrial community will be the control of these factors of production. The chief danger to the people will be to lose control of the instruments of industry. That danger, as we saw in our brief sketch of the Industrial Revolution, was immediately realized in the most sweeping measure. The people lost control of the tools of industry more completely than they ever lost control of the land. Under the old system, the workman owned the simple tools of his trade. Today, the working people have no part nor lot in the machines with which they work. In capitalistic production, there is a cooperation between two distinct groups, a small group which owns all the material factors of land and machinery, a large group which owns nothing but the personal factor of human labor power. In this process of cooperation, the propertyless group is at a fearful disadvantage. No attempt is made to allot to each workman his share in the profits of the joint work. Instead, he is paid a fixed wage. The upward movement of this wage is limited by the productiveness of his work. The downward movement of it is limited only by the willingness of the workman to work at so low a return. His willingness will be determined by his needs. If he is poor or if he has a large family, he can be induced to take less. If he is devoted to his family and if they are sick, he may take still less. The less he needs, the more he can get. The more he needs, the less he will get. This is the exact opposite of the principle that prevails in family life, where the child that needs most care gets most. In our family life, we have solidarity and happiness. In our business life, we have individualism and, well, not exactly happiness. The statistics of wages come with a shock to anyone reading them with an active imagination. In my city of Rochester, that's Rochester, New York, by the way, and this is the year 1907, the average wage for males over 16 reported by the United States Census of 1900 was $480.50 a year, and for females, $267.10. I do not know how accurate that was. It hardly matters. $50 one way or the other would mean a great deal to the families affected, but it would not change the total impression of pitiable inadequacy. But the real wages are not measured by dollars and cents, but by the purchasing power of the money. That the necessaries of life have risen in price in recent years is familiar enough to every housekeeper. Wages too have risen in some trades. Very earnest efforts have been made by experts to prove that the rise in wages has kept pace with the rise in prices, but with dubious results. Dunn's review some time ago compared the prices of 350 staple commodities in July, July 1, 1897 and December 1, 1901, and found that 100, that 101 dollars, I'm sorry, 1,013 dollars in 1901 would buy no more than 724 in 1897. Hence, if wages had remained apparently stationary, they had actually declined. The purchasing power of the wages determines the health and comfort of the working man and his family. It does not decide on the justice of his wage. That is determined by comparing the total product of his work with the share paid to him. The effectiveness of labor has increased immensely since the advent of the machine. The wealth of the industrial nations, consequently, has grown in a degree unparalleled in history. 
The laborer has doubtless profited by this in common with all others. He enjoys luxuries that were beyond the reach of the richest in former times. But the justice of our system will be proved only if we can show that the wealth, comfort, and security of the average working man in 1906 is as much greater than that of the average working man in 1760 as the wealth of civilized humanity is now greater than it was in 1760. No one will be bold enough to assert it. The bulk of the increase in wealth has gone to a limited class who in various ways have been strong enough to take it. Wages have advanced on foot. Profits have taken the limited express. For instance, the report of the Interstate Commerce Commission, June 1902, stated that from 1896 to 1902, the average wages and salaries of the railway employees of our country, which is 1,200,000 men, that is 1,200,000 1, men, had increased from $550 to 580, or 5%. During the same period, the net earnings of the owners had increased from 377 million to 610 million, or 62 percent. Thorold Rogers, in his great work, Six Centuries of Work and Wages, says, quote, It may well be the case, and there is every reason to fear it is the case, that there is collected a population in our great towns which equals in amount the whole of those who lived in England and Wales six centuries ago, but whose condition is more destitute, whose homes are more squalid, whose means are more uncertain, whose prospects are more hopeless than those of the peasant serfs of the Middle Ages or the meanest drudges of the medieval cities." End of quote. If the celebrated saying of John Stuart Mill is true that, quote, it is questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made of lighten the day's toil of any human being, end of quote, it means that the achievements of the human mind have been thwarted by human injustice. Our blessings have failed to bless us because they were not based on justice and solidarity. I'll put a link into a, a discussion of Solomon and how the era of Solomon, for all its glory, was also characterized by a total shift in the in the arrangements, the econ economic arrangements of Israel, a move from a basically rural economy to an urban and international economy. 